morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Hudson Institute's conference on Taiwan-U.S. economic relations. Taiwan is among the United States' top dozen trading partners. Its vibrant free economy is energized by a democratic political system, which is a powerful reminder of this ancient and advanced culture's success at combining free institutions with free markets. This flexibility is key to the solid economic and security relationship that exists between the U.S. and Taiwan. As issues arise that require action, um, for example, um, ones that affect our bilateral economic relations um, as Taiwan's future economic development, um, that's one of them, and possible partnership in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And yes, uh, Taiwan's growing importance as a tourist destination. Some of you may have noticed that yesterday's New York Times listed Taiwan in the top fifth of its tourist destinations for places to go in 2014. So, assembled here this morning to discuss these and other matters is a distinguished panel of experts. Their bios are included in the programs uh, on your seats there. I'll say a few words about each now and then call on members of the panels for their remarks. Following their presentations, uh, we'll have a short break, um, and that will be followed by a question period that may also include answers. Uh, William Liu is Senior Executive Economic Officer of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States. He served as negotiator in Taiwan's Ministry of Economic Affairs, where he was responsible for trade issues with the U.S., along with negotiations with New Zealand and Singapore. His government experience also includes service with Taiwan's uh, permanent mission to the World Trade Organization and with Taiwan's representative office in Australia, where he bore responsibility for promoting trade and investment. And as you will see, um, in his presentation, he brings this experience to the conference as a practitioner. Uh, Dr. Derek Scissors is an expert on U.S.-Asia economic relations. He's also a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and as an adjunct professor, teaches a course on the Chinese economy at George Washington University. Dr. Scissors has been a lecturer in the economics department at Hong Kong's Lingnan University and served in the Secretary of Defense's office, U.S. Secretary of Defense's office, as an action officer in international economics and energy. Dr. Scissors' understanding of Asia's great economies is grounded in both scholarship and practical experience. Dr. Patrick Cronin is an old friend and has a strategic grasp of the broad range of U.S. interests in East Asia that is unequaled in Washington. He is Senior Advisor and Director of the Asia-Pacific Security Program at the Center for New American Security here in Washington. Uh, Patrick was also Director of Studies at London's International Institute of Strategic Studies uh, and uh, the Senate, U.S. Senate confirmed him as a senior member of the U.S. Agency for International Development, their leadership team, in 2001. So he combines an experienced understanding of security with an equally deep knowledge of development issues in East Asia. So that's pretty much what I have to say, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Beer. Um, thank you, Seth, and 
uh, thank you, uh, Hilson uh, Institute, for uh, holding this uh, conference. I think this uh, conference was uh, held in a very good timing manner. For one, on one hand, that um, the TPP negotiation is at uh, its uh, reading up stage, and on the other hand, that as you may aware well, that uh, President March uh, in his uh, New Year's uh, statement mentioned that we are going to prepare ourselves to participate in the TPP. So um, I think it's a very good timing to have uh, a conference uh, in Washington to uh, evaluate the uh, uh, overall of um, U.S. Uh, Taiwan economic relations and the prospect for Taiwan's uh, potential participation in the, uh, to join the TPP. Um, as a trade official working on uh, U.S.-Taiwan uh, trade relations for nearly a decade, um, I'm very pleased to, uh, to be here to share with you my own view on our topic today, um, U.S.-Taiwan economic relations. And to review this uh, important relation from a, a broader perspective, um, I would first like to uh, look at the important role that U.S. has played in Taiwan's economic development and over the decades and uh, take a look at the challenges facing this relationship. Uh, I hope my presentation uh, can provide you with an update of the dynamic of um, this uh, bilateral relations and pave the way for the insightful discussion that uh, following two speakers uh, will share with us. Okay. Um, first, let's take a look of uh, Taiwan's uh, economic profile. Um, over the last six decades, the people in Taiwan has um, created an economic miracle from scratch. As you, as you can see from the PowerPoint, um, the GDP per capita in Taiwan has increased from 196 in 1952 um, to more than 20,000 uh, in 2012. Foreign trade has also increased from uh, 0.3 billion to 571 billion in 2012, which represents a 2,000 uh, times increase over the last six decades. Um, Taiwan is now also a predatory economy, holding the world's four largest stock of uh, foreign trade uh, exchange reserve, um, 515 billion at the end of November 2013. Only mainland China, Japan, and Russia has the uh, highest total. Through its continued efforts, um, Taiwan has now established many high-tech industrial clusters. Uh, ICT, uh, for example, uh, Taiwan ICT company play a key role in the global supply chain and is a leading supplier of uh, PC, foundries, service, LCD, etc. So. No question about it, um, the U.S. has made great contribution to Taiwan's economic development. In many aspects, they helped Taiwan to develop from an agricultural economy to a silicon inland society, island society. Um, today, I will, um, as you can see from the PowerPoint, um, Taiwan graduate uh, upgrade industry from agriculture to light, uh, in light industry, heavy industry, to uh, IT industry, and high tech industry. And in the process, uh, U.S. play key uh, uh, important roles in this process, including through uh, USA, through um, bilateral trade and investment, and U.S. also provides uh, great uh, assistance for Taiwan to join international forums like such as uh, APEC and WTO. Um, today I will um, highlight three of most significant contributions uh, in my presentation. Um, first, youth aid. Um, I'm not, we are of the view that USAID secured Taiwan's economic security uh, and uh, stability. First, the economic aid provided by the US from 1950 to 1965 was very important for Taiwan's uh, reconstruction after the war. Taiwan received a total of 1.5 billion in economic aid and 2.4 billion in military aid from US, accounting for 
5% of Taiwan's GMP. This aid was essential to control inf uh, inflation, stab stabilize financial situation, and enable Taiwan to invest in infrastructure. In addition to uh, uh, this uh, tangible uh, uh, economic aid, US AID also provides intangible aid, uh, I would call intangible, because uh, by offering advice on Taiwan's economic policy, um, for example, one legacy US AID led to Taiwan was to emphasize the importance of private enterprise as a source of economic growth. Um, as you may aware, the Formosa Plastic uh, Group is uh, one of Taiwan's largest companies and uh, one of the world's uh, largest PVC suppliers. But you may not know that um, this um, conglomerate uh, was created by a law program of USAID in 1954. This company recently uh, announced that it's planned for a two billion expansion of its uh, Texas operation. They will create a thousand of new jobs in the US. So this uh, example illustrates that USAID not only cultivate profound friendships with people in Taiwan, but also build up a strong partnership between the two countries nowadays. Um, and the second point I would like to highlight is the um, bilateral investment and uh, trade, the role that play in uh, uh, promote Taiwan's uh, advancement in technology. Um, the substantial investment from the U.S. together with bilateral trade are in fact important driving force for Taiwan's uh, industrial upgrading and technology advancement. In 1952, uh, Taiwan received its first uh, foreign investment from the GE. And that investment uh, triggered the government to enact the statute for investment by foreign nations in 1954. From 1952 to 2013, U.S. investment in Taiwan has accumulated to uh, 23 billion. Um, that account for 18% eight, uh, of uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, total foreign investment. And this is the largest source of foreign investment in Taiwan. Studies show that um, American investment stimulates Taiwan's capacity to produce manufactured products. And thanks to the reliability in delivery and flexibility in production, Taiwan's uh, SME, small and medium sized enterprise, were especially favored by American buyers. The American buyers uh, are not only placed the orders, but they also transfer the necessary technology um, to make sure that uh, the product uh, produced by Taiwan value the high standards. And through this process and direct uh, FDI, uh, U.S. Uh, multinational companies grow Taiwan into their production network. Nowadays, Taiwan's business possess a comprehensive and tiny supply chain in Asia Pacific region, especially with the United States. Many leading U.S. companies like uh, Google, um, like uh, Apple, have maintained close partnership with Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese firm as fundamental part of its um, global supply chain. Next, um, negotiation. As you are aware that uh, when you have the capacity to produce a product, and you also need a market to sell the product. Yeah. So um, the bilateral negotiation between the US and Taiwan help to ensure a level playing field for Taiwan's export. The U.S. first engaged Taiwan in their bilateral negotiation in 1978 and at attending market opening from Taiwan and exchange, um, U.S. were offered Taiwan um, to enjoy the concession U.S. made in uh, get Tokyo Run negotiation. In a sense, um, this negotiation, U uh, U.S use bilateral negotiation to incorporate Taiwan, a non, uh, at the time, a signatory of the GATT into the multilateral trading system. Um, 
At the later stage, um, Taiwan tried to diversify its export uh, to ensure a level playing field for its uh, export to other countries. And then Taiwan decided to join the GATT and the foreign uh, WTO. In this uh, context, U.S. also lent its strong support for Taiwan to join the GATTN WTO. Taiwan became a member of WTO in uh, 2002 and enjoyed MFF treatment for trading goods and service for over 95% of global market. And U.S., as you know, that uh, is the most important driving force for Taiwan to achieve this outcome. This trade negotiation not only bring Taiwan's um, trade regime more in line with international norms and uh, lay a good foundation for Taiwan to transform itself uh, to an innovative economy. At the same time, Taiwan also become a very close uh, partner uh, for the U.S. in the market level forum. For example, when I was in uh, Geneva uh, in year 2003 to 7, I, I was in charge of um, uh, Doha uh, NAMA negotiation. And we worked very closely with the U.S. in NAMA uh, uh, general tariff reduction and in sectoral liberalization. We also worked closely with the U.S. on service negotiation. And recently, we also work very closely uh, with the U.S. on IPA expansion, uh, TISA, Trading Service Agreement. So, the U.S. Um, uh, in a nutshell, the U.S. Um, Economic Act uh, directs uh, investment and effort to help Taiwan um, to enable Taiwan's goods and service to compete in the international a global market uh, on a level playing field. And among other things, has cultivated a very profound uh, friendship between the two countries. As former um, Secretary of uh, State, uh, Hillary Clinton, indicated, Taiwan is an important uh, security and economic partnership of the United States. My government treasures this friendship very much, and uh, we would like to develop it further to a mutual prosperity. But in this context, um, uh, we also um, see some worrisome, worrisome signs for our bilateral economic partnership. Um, for example, um, some studies argue that the economy of Taiwan and the U.S. are gradually decoupled. Uh, let's take a look at Taiwan's trade sheet. Taiwan's export to the U.S. as a percentage of uh, its uh, total export increased from about uh, 12% in 1960 to 38% in 1970. In 1980, the average uh, export to the U.S. was 42% of Taiwan's total export. Today, um, U.S. Taiwan's trade ties remain strong. Taiwan is uh, currently the 11th largest trading partner of the U.S. with uh, 63.2 billion in total trading goods during 2012. However, if you uh, take a look of uh, uh, the PowerPoint, Taiwan's export to the U.S. as percentage of its total export has dropped uh, from 36% in 1989 to around 10% in last year. A recent HSBC report, uh, report indicates that before uh, year 2008, that 1% increase in U.S. GDP would cause a 6% increase in Taiwan's export. But now the linkage is much less significant. It therefore claims that the economy of Taiwan and the U.S. have gradually de uh, decoupled. Um, as a trade official, and a former trade negotiator, um, we are very keen to know what other underlying reason or the factor result in this outcome. And is it the changing nature of bilateral industrial cooperation, investment, or it is because of grain trend of the regionalism? In fact, um, the question. <coughs> 
the question of whether an FTA could bring real benefit to the contracting party, and can it explain the degree of uh, bilateral trade volume in recent years? Are we uh, what we keen to learn? Um, Um, as you are well, uh, Korea is our most major competitor in foreign trade. Um, do we have people from Korea Mission here? If not, um, I'll go further. <laughs> <laughs> if you allow me, um, I wish to uh, use the FTA signed by Korea uh, and its uh, trading partner as an uh, illustration um, of the possible effect FTA may have on our export performance. Um, the PowerPoint um, show the up and down of our export uh, growth rate in the three markets before and after this FTA enter into effect. Uh, let's just take uh, Chorus FTA for example. Uh, before the Chorus FTA entered into force in March uh, 2012, the growth rate of Taiwan's export to US in 2011 was uh, 15.3 which uh, is close to Korea's 15.9. Uh, after, uh, after the Corus uh, FTA become effective, however, Taiwan's figure was down to minus 4.3% and compared with Korea, that continue to enjoy a higher uh, growth rate of 4.9. Uh, um, this um, represents a higher uh, percentage of 9.2 uh, points than Taiwan. One for the um, example I would like to show you is that one. Um, Korean FDA and Singapore FDA. In fact, the Korean and Singapore FDA was put to have uh, growth substantial benefit and generate a higher trade surplus for Korea. In addition to the trade volume, uh, trade growth rate, as you can see from the PowerPoint. Um, in addition, uh, for bilateral investment between um, uh, year 2005 and 6, Singapore's investment in Korea increased 43.2%, uh, and Korea's investment in Singapore increased 148.9%. Um, as you may well, um, Singapore maintained a zero tariff trade regime. Um, so why Korea and US, uh, sorry, Korea and Singapore FTA result in a substantial um, growth on trade in investment? According to a survey uh, conducted by um, Korean government for business with um, trade and investment in Singapore. 38.7% of uh, business believe that enhancement of traffic expectation and removal of um, trade barrier are the main reason for the increase in Korea export. 32.2% uh, are argue that Korean apps, uh, products have higher recognition in Singapore market, and 19.4% um, contend that Korean investment in Singapore lead to the increase of Korean exports to Singapore. So with all that in mind, um, I think it's fair to say that a uh, um, predict, uh, predictable uh, rule provided by FTA uh, can improve investor confidence in a country, which help attract foreign that way that. And we believe that engaging FTA exercise will bring Taiwan's trade and investment further in line with the international norm to foster industrial development and attract more foreign investment. Or they justify that US Taiwan FTA or Taiwan's uh, participate in the TPP would be the great solution to enhance the US Taiwan economic relation to a new level. Now, um, we are of the view that um, Taiwan's bid to the TPP is mutual beneficial for the US and Taiwan. Uh, or for some point I feel like uh, uh, I wish to highlight 
and I believe uh, our panelists uh, will provide more insightful um, ideas in, on this topic. So, well, uh, due to a time constraint, I will be very brief. First, um, Taiwan is the center of ASEAN Pacific region. Due to recent improvement in cross-trade relations, Taiwan has made significant contribution to the regional security and stability, as well as expand its economic and trade network. Taiwan's unique strategic position, its deep historic culture and economic tie with many China, and its close trade and investment uh, relations uh, with the ASEAN countries make Taiwan an indispensable partner as U.S. proceeds with its uh, rebalancing to uh, Asia. Um, second, um, we are of the view that Taiwan's pledge to join the TPP is uh, both economic and strategic decision. With ASEAN countries, uh, including Taiwan, uh, building much closer economic ties with many China. Uh, economic exchange between China and Chinese partners in Asia has significantly outgrown their exchange with the U.S. Due to Taiwan's global reach, particularly in ICT sector, Taiwan's integration into the wider Asian Pacific economy through TPP, as we believe, will enhance U.S. competitiveness in this region. In addition, um, as you are aware, uh, you, uh, Taiwan and many China have signed the APRA, which created a gateway to invest in many China. Taiwan's TPP, uh, TPP bid will open up new opportunities to expand economic trade and uh, investment relations with Taiwan and the U.S. in the Chinese market. To illustrate, um, according to a survey conducted by Mizuho Bank, uh, on Japanese investors in many China. The successful rate for investment made by Japanese uh, sole proprietorship is 68%. If the investment was made by a joint venture with Taiwan's company, the successful rate increased to seven, uh, 78%. Well, in conclusion, um, for Taiwan, uh, given Taiwan's high economic dependence on international trade. U.S. support uh, for Taiwan's participate in regional economic inter uh, integration negotiation will greatly assist our economic security. Joining the TPP has important implications for Taiwan's economic development. This is particularly true when Taiwan stands at critical juncture as the value at elements of our manufacturing sectors are diminishing and a new paradigms need to be introduced. On the other hand, for the U.S., I would say through the years, as I indicated in my presentation, of the cooperation and partnership, I would ask, what better frame in the ASEAN Pacific region does America have? Um, I, I do not mean that uh, the U.S. should support Taiwan's TPP bid or sign an FTA or DIA with Taiwan solely for our friendship. As uh, the famous quote by um, John Rockefeller, he said, a friendship founded on business is better than a business founded on friendship. Um, as indicated by my presentation, Taiwan's TPP bid will be mutual beneficial uh, for both U.S. and Taiwan. This provides great business opportunity uh, that will further consolidate our friendship with the U.S. and help the two friends to continue to stand side by side during the decades ahead. Uh, I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, 
uh, let's see. I guess I, the theme of the presentation, I, I hate to, to immediately become depressing, but that's what economics is supposed to do, right? So I'll just jump right into being depressing. The theme of the presentation is, is I, I don't feel that Taiwan, and to a lesser extent the U.S. as a close friend of Taiwan, realize the economic risk that Taiwan is in, potentially, uh, from the TPP. Um, I am an outsider in the TPP, but I've seen a couple of the chapters because I help the government with it, and you never know how these things are going to turn out, including whether it's going to pass the U.S. Congress. But I think there's a lot of risk in the TPP to Taiwan. I appreciate my colleague on the panel pointing out the possibilities, but I think the risks are underemphasized. So that's the theme. Let's, let's start with the, the good stuff, which is that, as we know, Taiwan punches well above its size <coughs> on trade. Population of 23 million, no natural resources, and total trade of, of 573 billion or so last year, which makes it a top 20 trading uh, nation in the world. In U.S. Taiwan in particular, I'm going quickly through these because we know most of this stuff. Um, Taiwan is 12th uh, as the American trade partner at over 60 billion, and it's close to the supposed emerging giant of India, which of course has a population 50 times larger. Um, Taiwan doesn't do as well as investment because the most of the majority of outbound investment from Taiwan is in China um, rather than anywhere else. It doesn't do that well on inbound investment because it's not that hospitable. Um, Taiwanese inbound investment last year, in 2012 rather, was about $5.6 billion. There was one mainland Chinese investment in the U.S. that was larger than that. So all foreign investment in Taiwan is smaller than one mainland Chinese investment in the U.S. That is not justified by Taiwan's financial situation. Um, the, another sort of qualitative sign is that uh, Taiwan is, of course, involved in supply chains that reflect the most important advances in technology and trade over the last 30 years. Um, personal computers, phones, which are practically curved personal computers. Again, this is stuff we're aware of. Um, one thing I want to say that I think people don't quite get, and it's relevant to my worries for Taiwan, is that there's an economic equivalent to self-determination. We always talk about that on the political side of town as a democracy, and we want it to be able to determine its own future. The economic equivalent is not as important, but it is pretty striking. When small economies can do well, you have an open global economic system where opportunity is spread more evenly. If you look at Taiwan, Taiwan should not be wealthy. It's, it has nothing. It, has, you know, it's a, it doesn't have a big population. It has no natural resources. And the fact that it's doing well means that we have a, a, an economy, a global economy where there's a lot of opportunity and smart policies and hard work can pay off, which they have for Taiwan. Now, I'm concerned that Taiwan now faces the challenge that, that many wealthier societies have, which is they begin to defend the status quo rather than moving forward. And now I'm going to move into um, what I think is the mistaken Taiwanese defense of the status quo, which is putting it at peril. So Taiwan's trade per capita is about 25,000 per person. So there's about $25,000 of trade volume per person in Taiwan, which is about in the top 15 of the world. A country in the top 15, and some of the countries ahead of it are microstates, like, like Singapore. Some of the countries ahead of it are oil exporters, which is not a healthy trading system. It's just drawing stuff out of the ground and then wasting it. So arguably, Taiwan as a healthy trader is even higher, more like top 10. Taiwan should be hyper-aggressive about trade policy, not fretting constantly that China is keeping us out of everything. That is not the appropriate response. The world is not ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus six. There is much more opportunity around the world, and Taiwan should be a global trader. Um, the Singapore and New Zealand deals are nice, but those are very, very small economies. Taiwan, we, we've heard, um, uh, They'll say that you know, Korea is Taiwan's number one competitor. Korea is much more aggressive with India than Taiwan has been. Why? Taiwan is much in far more need than Korea to be aggressive with India. India is a very difficult partner. But the Koreans have found certain Indian states um, that are good partners, and Taiwan hasn't. Brazil, another example. Like, there are big countries that don't listen to Chinese pressure and aren't regional economies. Taiwan should be much more active in seeking partnerships with those countries than it is, and way too focused on ASEAN and Chinese opposition. For that matter, um, dealings with the U.S. Uh, yes, the U.S. is parochial sometimes. You know, we have senators, unnamed senators, who are soon to be ambassadors to the People's Republic, but I won't mention their names, you know, who are obsessed with you know, their ex the main export from their one state as driving U.S. policy on occasion. It's absolutely true that the U.S. is parochial. Taiwan's not in a position to point that out. The U.S. has a population of 323 million, not 23. 
and tons of natural resources and tons of technology. Taiwan should not be thinking, well, you know, the U.S. does these things in our trade negotiations. Taiwan should be thinking, what do we do to make sure we have access to the U.S. market and the exports we need from the United States? So it is not the case that if the U.S. is parochial, Taiwan should be parochial. They're not the same economies. Can't act that way. Um, the investment side, if anything, is worse than the trade side. Uh, we always talk about we, we don't want China, Taiwan to become too dependent on China for trade. Taiwan is much more dependent on China for investment. Um, bilateral and multilateral agreements that Taiwan is seeking to have to now, and I hope that changes, focus too much on trade and not enough on investment. We know Taiwan has a lot of money to invest. It also needs a lot of things from the outside. There should be much larger two-way investment and much more balanced two-way investment. Let's talk about TPP for a second. Um, Eventually, TPP could be a wonderful opportunity for Taiwan to defeat its international isolation, kind of a dynamic, large organization that Taiwan is a part of. So there's no question that the, the potential is there, the opportunities are there. Um, but it should be that now, and it's not. What it is now is a double-barreled, meaning there are two dimensions, threat to Taiwan and the U.S.-Taiwan economic relationship. So what's the first threat, first barrel? It's a weak deal. And the U.S. becomes, so we get TPP, and it really doesn't do very much. It's a diplomatic deal like so many agreements in Asia, like RCEP will be. Um, and the U.S. becomes comparatively less of an economic important in Asia. U.S. importance in Asia has been unavoidably declining, uh, unevenly, but unavoidably. TPP is this big initiative that can change that. It's the core of the rebalancing, because the security part is under-resourced. Um, without that, we get a weak agreement that doesn't really change the dy economic dynamics in Asia, and we can go into great detail about what that means. Um, we get a U.S. that's kind of withdrawing, uh, effectively. It's not actively withdrawing, but the pace of change in Asia outstrips the American economic engagement in Asia. That leaves Taiwan with fewer options and, f and less powerful friends. Uh, that is not a good outcome, uh, a, a weak TPP. But it's better than the other outcome. The, the other outcome is it's a strong agreement, and Taiwan is left behind. Um, a strong dynamic TPP, uh, Taiwan hasn't responded, in my view, at all adequately to the ASEAN agreements, which are much weaker. Um, I, it's wonderful that Taiwan wants to join TPP, but that is not a response. A response is changing one's policies. A response is saying we want to join as soon as possible, 2015. You know, a month after the, the agreement is signed, we want to be in active negotiations to be the next member. Right? That's, you know, Indonesia doesn't need to do that. It probably should, but it doesn't need to because Indonesia is much bigger. Taiwan, as I said at the outset, needs to be much more aggressive about its trade policy. It hasn't responded nearly adequately to TPP, in my view, and there's no sign that it can. Um, the comment about we'll join in 10 years, we'll join in 8 years, I mean, I know this number is shrinking and the, and the my administration has become more aware of, of how silly it sounds. Um, Taiwan should be saying we want to be in right now. If we could, we would join right now. And here are all the things that we're doing to get ready to join. Now, it could be that TPP turns out to be weak, and that's a waste of time. We're talking about a risk here, a risk that it's a very strong dynamic agreement. And we will work hard every moment for the next eight years, ten years, six years, whatever it is. Because otherwise, Taiwan's economic position, the prosperity that is built, is at risk. And the obvious risk here, and I'm, I'm going to be done soon because I think this point is fairly clear, the obvious risk here is that a trade-dependent economy is using another measure of market access again, but instead of lose, using it as, as we saw in the, in the PowerPoint a second ago to, to just Korea or Singapore or so on, it's losing it to a huge group of partners that could get bigger. So it's actually Taiwan's existing problems on steroids. TPP is, is all the problems Taiwan's had to now, only much worse, because the part, group of partners are much bigger. Now let me make a more pointed comment that I really wish my Taiwanese colleagues all over would listen to. TPP has U.S., Japan, Malaysia. Korea can join like that, because they've already made most of the concessions in the chorus agreement. U.S., Japan, Malaysia, Korea don't need Taiwan in the electronic supply chain anymore. They don't. The core of Taiwanese engagement with the world is at risk with a good TPP, which we don't know that we have, plus Korea. Um, electronic supply chains don't change overnight, but they do change, and also supply chains, not just electronics, and they don't change back very quickly. It's not as if you reroute the supply chain, and then eight years later, Taiwan joins TPP and says, okay, we're back. No, what happened? We watch what what, uh, what happens in terms of uh, location of production in Japan long term after the tsunami. 
No reason to move back to Japan. Now, the last comment, and uh, this is another thing that I want, I've tried to make people in the U.S. aware of. We're talking about the U.S. Taiwan side. Tried and tried and tried, and we'll try, be trying again later today when we talk about Trade Promotion Authority. I'll be talking to the Hill about Trade Promotion Authority because there's some language in it that are very, is very worrisome for everyone, including Taiwan, in my view. Hopefully, they'll reassure me on the Hill. Um, so TPA has this page, you can look it up, it's page uh, 88, I believe, and has this language about you can't have benefits outside the agreement. And that is not language anybody in the world should want to see in the U.S. Trade Commission Authority. And what it suggests in particular is that we're going to get guidance for tight rules of origin in U.S. trade agreements. What are tight rules of origin? It means that, okay, if this has to be in the trade group for us to treat it preferentially. If it's outside the trade group, no preference, which means that the trade group looks more like a block than a liberalization. Now think about the risk to Taiwan in general if TPP is a trade block with Taiwan outside. And again, I'm not saying this is true. I'm going to be trying to make sure it's not true with whatever little influence I might have on the Hill. But it's a threat, and it's in the TPA, language that would guide negotiators, if they took it seriously, to go for tighter rather than looser rules of origin. Now what's the big blow here? There are people in the United States Congress, there are people in the United States uh, politics in general, there are people all over the United States, there may be people in this room who think that TPP is a great way to put the screws to China. And the whole idea of tight rules of origin is to make Chinese goods less competitive. So whose economy is bound up with China's? Both in supply chains and in other ways. Tight rules of origin in the TPP, I don't know what the risk is. I don't know, you know there's a, there's a, there's a spectrum of loose to tight. So, you know, I'm being very imprecise. But let's say there's a 20 to 30 percent chance of really tight rules of origin. Really tight rules of origin in the TPP put Taiwan at extreme risk. And we get a complete wrenching of the way the Asia-Pacific uh, economy is organized. And I don't see any, again, that's 20 to 30 percent chance, which means 70 to 80 percent chance it won't happen. But 20 to 30 percent chance I get fired from my job after the speech, I'd be very careful about this speech. And I don't see that Taiwan is reacting in that way. I see Taiwan saying, look at all the things we've done and we're so important, like a roadshow. Roadshow isn't going to do it. Changes need to be made now in Taiwan so that Taiwan can jump to the head of the TPP line. Look at Korea. Look, Korea joins TPP. What's their incentive? Is their incentive to support Taiwanese membership? Or is it to support, you know the Philippines would be a good member ahead of Taiwan. They're a U.S. treaty ally and a growing economy with a large labor force. Right? The strategic part of this is really unpleasant. I can see us standing here in 2020 still wondering about Taiwanese TPP membership, and that is a very dangerous thing. Thank you. Well, good morning, and thank you for uh, Seth's kind uh, comments and introduction, and Mr. Lee's presentation, as well as Derek Scissor's presentation. Set up my brief remarks about really the strategic and economic interplay here that, from a U.S. perspective, um, makes the, the slowing down of the economic relationship between Taiwan and the U.S. just a little bit to the decoupling, if you will, um, has strategic implications. Um, I want to make just a few points. Let me go back to one that Seth Cropsey opened up with, which was the success story for the U.S. Agency for International Development. You don't often hear that trumpeted in Washington, D.C. in recent decades, that there are success stories coming out of USAD of a strategic large nature. But in fact, the development of a number of the Asian tiger economies uh, was largely catalyzed by USAID, and Taiwan was indeed one of those. For us to not a due concern to that from the U.S. policy perspective looking to the future would be throwing away history, would be throwing away a deep and abiding investment that the United States have to make. Um, and that's something that I don't think is trivial. Um, but the fact that security and economics uh, are um, intertwined, as Mr. Liu uh, alluded to again, that uh, economics is the underpinning of security, and indeed security is predicated and is determined and, and purpose for economics and trade. It's, it's to promote the global commons. That's the reason why we have the military's 
in the first place to try to maintain trade and commerce and uh, freedom. And this is this is very important here because um, right now for Taiwan, security is economic and military at the same time. I want to talk a bit more from the security angle and then get back to the the economic opportunity and the risk that Derek Scissors rightly points out faces Taiwan on something like Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Taiwan Relations Act is 35 years old this April. Um, so Deng Xiaoping comes to power in 1978 and makes a revolutionary change for China to bring it out into the world, a, a massively uh, positive change for the world uh, and for most Chinese. Um, and in fact declares the Soviet Union to be China's main threat. Huge opportunity strategically for the United States. And we respond, of course, in 1979 by severing relations, ending the mutual security treaty with Taiwan, that it helped protect Taiwan from the risk of invasion or threat of invasion um, and since 1955. And um, we, we established diplomatic relations with the PRC, of course, and established one China policy. But at the same time, we, look, we have de facto diplomatic relations with the governing authorities in Taipei. Um, and that's the Taiwan Relations Act, which um, doesn't guarantee that we would automatically intervene if Taiwan were threatened. And lots of different ways Taiwan could be threatened. Right now it's being essentially squeezed, however. Squeezed the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, which has been so successful across the Strait. And tensions are at an all-time low in many ways across the Taiwan Strait. That's good news. But at the same time, Taiwan has a very uncertain picture of its future of independence, of maintaining an independent, integrated economy uh, and, a, and a free, democratic society. So from a U.S. perspective, having invested heavily in Taiwan's success, we need to continue to work with Taiwan to find ways to strengthen Taiwan's confidence to deal with an assertive, um, at least those forces that are assertive in Beijing, or just from further isolationism from what is a growing international economy, globalization, or a growing regional uh, trade and economic architecture, however multifaceted. Um, one of the problems is that while there's peace across the Taiwan Strait today, um, there is also a deteriorating military balance from Taiwan's perspective and from the U.S.-Taiwan perspective. I remember when Joseph Nye was heading the National Intelligence Council in the 1990s, the Clinton administration, he often said that the tipping point against Taiwan, the, the point at which it would lose advantage in the military balance would be around the 2010-2012 time frame. Well, we're now in 2014, and indeed, many people have, uh, if anything, pointed to uh, accelerating People's Liberation Army uh, capabilities, especially at sea and air, cyberspace, uh, space, um, and it's not just the number of missiles having gone up uh, ninefold in the last 12-13 years, um, but also the fact that China actively aspires really to having local uh, dominance um, in, uh, in by the end of this decade. Um, so last October, Taiwan's defense ministry issued a formal statement warning that by 2020, China will be able to successfully invade Taiwan, um, even potentially fending off a U.S. intervention. So um, we don't know whether that's true or not, but the point is that there's a perception that this could be the continuation of a deteriorating military balance trend. It's not going in Taiwan's favor, in other words. So Taiwan needs to make sure that it can not only protect itself militarily somehow, longer into the future, to buy more space for diplomacy and for trade, but it needs to make sure that it has a diversified set of relations in the world. It's not isolated internationally, either politically or, dip or economically, um, in order to uh, be truly uh, better protected uh, as part of both the region and, and the global economy. Um, so it's, it's also clear that military deterrence needs to be bolstered. That's a separate discussion for another, another conference. Um, but without a balanced economic strategy and sufficient political space, Taiwan will simply be absorbed. Um, it will be absorbed within the next couple of decades. Uh, so I would argue that uh, we can now look at what's been happening in the East and South China Seas and the fact that this is one of the growing flashpoints globally when you look at the maritime tensions that have grown in the East and South China Seas. And of course, Taiwan straddles both, both of these seas in terms of its geographic position and in terms of its own national some claims of sovereignty as well. China is increasingly seeking to settle sovereignty disputes on its own and to expand its influence. 
not just over what it considers core national interests, but also the East and South China Seas, which are sometimes added to the list of core national interests, depending on which person you're talking to from China. Um, President Ma in Taiwan has taken a number of steps, mostly quite positive, to try to add a helpful diplomatic level of restraint on some of the disputes. So we can think about um, how um, the, um, the fishing agreement between Taipei and Tokyo uh, was a very helpful way of showing that you don't have to use course of diplomacy, you can actually use negotiation to uh, advance cooperation and still, and still have a dispute and still make your claims uh, to sovereignty. And that's what Taiwan does to this day. I know I visited Taiwan recently, I heard from many of my Taiwan friends just how strongly they are about the sovereignty claims um, that Japan also claims. And yet that didn't stop Taiwan or Japan from moving forward with the Fisheries Agreement. You could also argue that Taiwan, um, while it did conduct air and naval drills in the Bashi Channel a week after the 65-year-old fisherman uh, was killed by a Philippine Coast Guard vessel, um, nonetheless, uh, Taiwan held its fire and waited for an apology, and relations were able to move forward once again. Um, Taiwan has also been helpful in terms of calming down uh, some of the tensions since the Chinese announced an air defense identification zone of the East China Sea last month, um, and President Ma has called and urged um, President Xi Jinping not to establish one in the South China Sea, not because there's not a right for air defense identification zones by any country, but when you announce one suddenly in an area that you know is hotly disputed, that's only going to be seen as a provocation by those other uh, countries in the region. And so China now has an opportunity uh, on, uh, as it enforces passage of shipping, uh, as it's declared the uh, domestic fishing laws, um, that it will be enforced this year, um, basically requiring all the countries in the region to uh, get permission from China to pass through if this is fully enforced. Um, this is something that we're, uh, again, Taiwan can play a positive role in, in sort of encouraging Beijing not, not to, to look for a more provocative course of means of exercising or expressing its claims, but rather looking for cooperation. And economics really are the big blue in the cooperation, even while they cut both ways, as Bert says, as he pointed out, by showing how competitive it is. Um, rebalancing has always been predicated on economic thinking, even if it didn't appear to be so. Um, Derek Sosers has rightly pointed out that it's the most active part of the rebalancing policy um, in terms of what might change and what's being uh, given time and attention. But really from 2009, Secretary of State Clinton, Assistant Secretary of State for Campbell, uh, talked about a strategic pivot, a shift to rebalancing to Asia Pacific because this was where the economic opportunity was. It wasn't in endless counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, even though those couldn't be completely ignored. That was not going to get the U.S. economy um, off of the declining path. But rather, we we're going to have to seize and integrate with these, these rising economies. Um, the Trans Pacific Partnership was, of course, embraced by the, the Bush administration which entered talks back in 2008 with the new trading quartet of Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore. And those negotiations have since grown, and that's where they become the Trans-Pacific Partnership Framework talks. And um, TPP is really trying to set a free trade agreement that isn't just rhetoric, but is indeed these higher standards of trade. And that's, that's what makes this, I think, very different and why um, again, I agree with Derek Scissors' caveat that it's not taken seriously, it's not fully implemented, it could be weak and, and, and more rhetorical. But I believe it's meant to be extremely serious in terms of setting the new standard for trade, and that's why this is going to be the decisive trading framework across the Asia Pacific. Um, and it's therefore even more vital for Taiwan to be in uh, rather than out because of the risk of being further isolated. Um, it was Kurt Campbell who pointed out that Vietnam has made much bigger strides than Taiwan would have to make in terms of political reform to enter the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So the fact that President Ma has now reasserted an interest in joining the TPP, and it's really well outlined the interest here of Taiwan, um, it seems like there is a, a ready opening 
Um, and I agree with Derek Scissor's point that this is an urgent matter of now, not some distant point in the future. So it's really a matter of political will for Taiwan to take the steps necessary to use TPP framework negotiations to come to some successful conclusion in the next several months, potentially, to spur that domestic economic reform and trade liberalization that's necessary for Taiwan to join. One small quibble with, uh, with Derek's points, um, because I learn a lot always from when he speaks, is I don't consider a $28 billion two-way trade between Singapore and Taiwan to be trivial. Uh, he's a, it's a smaller economy, yes, compared to India and Brazil, no doubt, absolutely true. Um, but Singapore is a, is a serious economy, um, and I think that's a, a, you know, and it's also one of the TPP uh, countries, as is New Zealand, and I think those are important stepping stones toward the direction that we want to go in on TPP. So the U.S. wants stability with China, wants stability between China and Taiwan, but it wants Taiwan to be able to maintain its freedom economically and politically by being deeper, more deeply integrated in the growing regional sort of trade framework, but also the growing global economy. And I'll stop there and look forward to the Q&A that will follow. Thank you. Let me open up the floor for questions. See a hand right over here. Hi. Um, and the microphone will arrive. And has arrived. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Victoria Guida. I'm a reporter with Inside U.S. Trade. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Liu. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, do you think that China will have to join TPP before Taiwan? And uh, my second question is, uh, in Trade Promotion Authority, um, are you pushing for the U.S. to have Taiwan-specific language in the bill? Could I have your second question again? Uh, <laughs> um, in, in the Trade Promotion Authority bill, um, if, if there is one passed by Congress, um, will you push for there to be Taiwan-specific language since the U.S. doesn't officially recognize Taiwan to be a country, so it would, it would sort of have to, as I understand it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, for your first question, We, we hope that uh, Taiwan uh, uh, participate in uh, the TPP be considered on its own merit. And uh, because of we are of the view that um, if Taiwan is crude from the APEC uh, regional integration, uh, in, uh, in particular uh, TPP, it will put Taiwan in dangerous position point out in my presentation. And it will put Taiwan uh, to the sideline of ASEAN Pacific um, production network, just as Jack mentioned uh, in his uh, presentation. So I think you have uh, highlighted the point, the China factor. Uh, in this regard, um, I think we will continue to communicate uh, with many China through a uh, cross trade uh, dialogue to foster mutual understanding and uh, uh, trust on Taiwan's need and the sense uh, and the urgency to join TPP and other integration initiatives in the region. Um, I think that this is um, especially important. For Chinese leadership to recognize the fact that a larger room for Taiwan to participate in the regional integration is not only vital to uh, Taiwan's economic development, it will also bring confidence uh, in Taiwan to further uh, enhance cross trade economic and trade uh, interaction with many China. So, uh, in the nutshell, we hope that Taiwan's uh, lead to the TPP will consider by the TPP member of its own merit. Um, on your second question, um, actually, um, when Jack uh, just finished his uh, 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 remark, I put one question to him. Um, I consider myself well to head in, in this uh, conference. One is a panelist, another one is uh, 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 a listener. And the question I put to Jack is that, um, I'm quite interested uh, uh, in the point he made about whether it's necessary for 
the TPA recently uh, introduced by the Congress, uh, were it necessary uh, to have some language for Taiwan to uh, improve in the TPA? As you may aware that uh, Taiwan Relations um, Act uh, give the uh, mandate uh, or mandate the U.S. government to sign trade agreement with Taiwan. And why we need a new language or extra language uh, to put on the TPA uh, to allow Taiwan to sign uh, or to uh, sign a, uh, for example, a bilateral uh, trade agreement with the U.S. or Taiwan's bid to uh, the TPP. Um, I would like to uh, over this question to Jack, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, um, I am not a lawyer. I will be saying that many times in the next few months because TPA, which I read twice on Friday, is written by lawyers. Um, several of whom I know very well, uh, unfortunately or fortunately. I, I, I can't, I'm not a lawyer, I don't have an independent position on this, and also um, nothing I say is binding on anyone. The Congress will do whatever it wants regardless of whether it makes sense. In rather extensive discussions about TPA, the only time uh, I heard I, just not the person not involved in all the discussions, obviously, or, or even most of them, the only time I ever heard Taiwan brought up, it was deemed by the lawyers present that there was no need for separate treatment of Taiwan in the language. That other, that there was nothing in the TPA that said, you know, required uh, a definitive statement about Taiwan's sovereign status and that previous agreements on Taiwan you know, were sufficient. I have no idea whether that's true, one. And it, whether it's true or not doesn't really bear on what will actually happen. But you know, the TPA itself does not have any mention of Taiwan. It was not, there was no need to mention Taiwan that was brought up. It was decided there wasn't a need. So m and my expectation is there will be no separate treatment of Taiwan in the TPA. The Congress can decide differently for substantive reasons. The Congress can decide differently for political reasons. It can decide to send a message by including a line about Taiwan, even though there's no need for one. So there are lots of possibilities here. Um, the meetings and the text, that I, the text that we all see now, that we can't all read if you're really, really bored. Um, and the meetings that I had said there won't be any separate treatment. 